I'm Heather Conroy. Um, I run a couple of support groups. Sorry, let me get my microphone straight here. So I run a couple of support groups. Um, one with parents, which actually I had to learn quite a bit about myself to be able to do that because I'm not a parent, um, but I work with adults and I work with a lot of their adults. Um, so what I was finding was that they were experts and really had a lot of information and tried a lot of different programs. And from that, a few parents and I came together and we started a support group. That was uncomfortable for me in the beginning because I just, I, I, the feeling of judgment was definitely there. Like, you know, I, I'm not a parent. Um, what are they gonna think of me being in this situation? Um, but it really turned into, and it taught me a lot, it taught me a lot about how to, you know, bring in, you know, and think about the group dynamics and think about how these people can work together. And I'm not always fixing things or telling people what to do. You know, it's a lot of, well, what, I know that you did something, so, you know. And I think sometimes the parents aren't always really recognizing how valuable they might be to this other person who's going through a similar situation. Um, so I also work with college students and young adults, and we have someone who's 57, so it's like 19 to 57 is the range that I'm working with at this point, but it's been really fun. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, and I'm Ralph Welps, uh, a clinical psychologist. When I was a young man, I had a pretty severe eating disorder, and that experience had led to the loss of my first marriage and pro almost the loss of a profession back in the 70s. As a result, I got involved pretty, pretty early on with the whole field of eating disorders and support groups. And support groups for people with eating disorders that nobody believed should have eating disorders, like men. And uh, so support groups for men with eating disorders are really fascinating things to try and be involved with and to try and run. Uh, also, just like Heather, I started out really wet behind the ears. Came back to Western Pennsylvania as coal miner's son had training in New York City with all kinds of psychoanalysis and things like that. When I got a job, it was with the first citizen-controlled mental health organization in the state, supported by parents of kids with special needs, who in those days, we're talking about the late 60s, early 70s, had nothing. And so their job was, as they saw it, to beat on a system and make special supports for their kids happen. They hired me because, not because there was anything good about me, but because I had this PhD and they figured that they could throw me up against the other people who were saying no to them. So there I was, kid, really, in so many ways, and learning from parents. I'll never forget the, the uh, experience I had with the woman who became my wife and the special needs son that she had who became my son, one of my sons, first time I had to do a support group of parents. And um, I know what I was gonna say, I didn't know what I was gonna do, and I pulled Mary, my wife, aside, she and I had already worked together on some things. I said, Mary, <sighs> I'm 29 years old, I'm hyperventilating, I don't know what to do here. And she said, calm down, Ralph. Just, if they start looking bored, just tell them that you know about tennis shoes and Q-tips. I said, tennis shoes and Q-tips? She said, just trust me. So, I and I started blathering along and people were looking glassy-eyed and fun. And I saw it, to my credit, I made the shift and I saw that I, I didn't just go deer in the headlights. And I said, well, you know, I may look pretty young here, but I know something about tennis shoes and Q-tips. And everybody just started grinning and the group went great. And I went over to Mary, I go, what did I say? You know? <laughs> she said, well, listen, 
whenever you're a parent of a handicapped kid, especially these days, she said, you don't have a lot of money and your kids get KEDS to wear. KEDS, that, well, I guess some of you are old enough to know what KEDS are. <laughs> High top tennis shoes with funny stuff on the soles. And she said, especially if they're having trouble with toilet training, she says, they walk in it. And almost every parent, then they smell something funny. They look down, at their, they take their kids' shoes and they go, ew. And the first thing they do, Ralph, is they throw the shoes in the washer. And then they discover that that doesn't get anything out. It just vulcanizes the stuff in there. And so they find themselves sitting there with a Q-tip and a tennis shoe trying to pick the crap out of the suction cups in the bottom saying, why am I alive? And that's the reason why they smiled when you said that. So that's where I first learned that just being a uh, support group facilitator doesn't make you an expert. So, but yes, since that time I've done uh, a lot of work with uh, folks who have uh, religious backgrounds, um, folks who are going through life's changes, and um, uh, people who have uh, severe and unusual addiction problems because of the eating disorders and because of some of the other nowadays uh, behavioral addictions and some of which we deal with with people on the autism spectrum, some of which we deal with in other kinds of unusual addiction situations with people in our support groups. So that's, uh, and I'm in private practice in Pittsburgh and uh, primarily as a psychotherapist. So some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today have to do with um, understanding how people are in a room and how to get them to really hook up in that room. And that's going to be my part of our discussion today. There's a tool that is in place that has to be there for you no matter what other tools you have, so that you learn how to use the tools or know when to use the tools that you do know as a support group facilitator, as a parent, as a loved one, whatever. And that tool is a perceptual tool. It's the ability to shift your attention to spontaneously scan your environment to extract meaning from it and to change your behavior based on that. That ability to shift, to scan, to get meaning from it and then to change your behavior, that underlies all of what we're doing whenever we're facilitating a support group. Um, the, and we're going to give you tools for how to help you make this shift. By the way, when I said scan the environment, I don't just mean scan what's going on out here. I mean also how to scan your own inside environment, your own emotional climate. Because as a support group facilitator, one of your most valuable sources of information is your own gut. And that doesn't just shout at you. Sometimes it whispers to you. You know, sometimes the, the, the messages that you're getting are subtle ones. And, and if you're locked down on something, like, oh my God, I don't know how to help this person, or oh my God, I'm, I'm dying here, nobody, nobody likes me, or uh, uh, everybody's half asleep, or if, that, if you're locked down on those thoughts, there's other messages that you're not going to pick up. When I was in training, I was a VA trainee. In those days, the Veterans Administration would, would pay for people to go to graduate school to be clinical psychologists because they were using 
the, the psychologists to take care of folks who were uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, post-World War II, post-Korea, and then just as I was coming out, uh, Vietnam. And uh, I was posted at a VA hospital in Northport, New York. Great big place where there were people there who had been there for patients who had been there since the VA started back in 1930. They lived there. And one of my things I was supposed to learn was how to do group therapy. And I was doing group therapy with veterans and their families. The moms, the wives, the kids would come in and we'd have, they'd have these groups. And I was clueless. I had, I, I would spend a lot of time with my mentor. This one time I came in and I said, I don't know what to do. I'm, I, I can't make anything good happen in this group. I think I should just drop out of school. He said, Ralph, listen, you've told me about when you were a kid and you did construction work. You told me about being a dowser. It means you can find water. Uh, like, you, you know, like Amish people, they have this forked stick and they walk around and it goes down where the water is. Hey, that's real. <laughs> that that happened. And my dad and his father and my uncles, they can do that. And I can do it too, but we didn't we we weren't real dramatic about it. We'd use coat hangers. You bend the coat hangers out and you make two L shapes and you hold the ends and you walk along. And when you go over where the water is, they cross. And if you keep walking, they point back. You back up and they point like that. And you go to the side, they go like this the other side, and they go like that. They cross where water is. My dad and I would use them to try and find culverts or water mains when we were laying out a road, something like that. It was just something that you had in there along with the, the transit, the stakes, the hammers, the machete, the, the wires. He said, you know, you told me, Ralph, that you uh, are a dowser and that you could find water. I said, well, yeah. He said, well, here's what I want you to do. When you go back in that group, go back in there and try, try not so much to listen to what people are saying. And don't worry about what people are saying. He said, try not to watch what people look like. As a matter of fact, he says, cross your eyes a little bit. So that way you can't really see him that well. And he says, pretend that your whole body is a dousing rod. Just let yourself rock a little bit, back and forth, like that. And he says, you know what's going to happen? He said, because you're a dowser, you're going to be pulled in the direction where the problem is. And I tried it. And it worked. It turned out that there was this one wife of one of the veterans who didn't say a word. But when I really picked up, because I was being pulled in her direction, she was sending out these waves of disapproval at everything everybody was saying. She wasn't saying a word, but she'd, she'd, she'd send these real subtle little eye rolls and stuff like that. And every time somebody tried to say something that mattered, whoosh, down and so I, I got a real handle on it. And I went back into his office. I said, oh, Eli, man, you got it. I am such a psychic. And he said, Ralph, calm down. You're not a psychic. He said, first off, this thing you were doing, he said, it's an old trick that we use in group therapy. He said, what happens is that our bodies do what's called body armoring. When something tenses us up or scares us, our muscles tighten up. And depending on what direction that threat is, our muscles are going to tighten up more on that side of our torso. And so if you can relax and shift and allow yourself to pay attention to that tension pattern, you're going to be bent in the direction that the threat is. Being able to shift your attention and scan the environment is something that takes practice. 
there are a lot of ways that people have of, of teaching themselves to break loose from their fear, from their, hypnot their ability to be hypnotized by content. Have any of you felt yourselves being having to shake yourself loose of something like almost like a dog shaking off water in a support group and uh, moving past feeling stuck. But I find with having people with too many different um, age groups of kids in the group, it was a general support group. I was concerned about pleasing everybody and making sure it was all worth their time to have come out that night. I've certainly been there myself. And while you're worried about that issue, what's probably happening is there's all kind of things happening in the here and now in the group that you could be working on that's going to really make the group pop if you aren't self-aware enough, if you aren't making the shift and knowing that, you were, uh, that your group is being fragmented by one person's over dominance, let's say, of the time in the group and, and the reactions of other people, if you don't recognize that, then all the tools in the world aren't going to help because you're not going to know to use them. And so you're going to be just floating along like in the lifeboat without a rudder, just like all the rest of the group people do. And what's interesting is that they probably feel like that a lot in their own lives whenever there's other people who do the same thing to them. See, uh, one thing we hadn't talked about before that I think also is important in a support group is the idea that one of our goals as facilitators, aside from bringing the expertise that we'll talk about into the room, is to provide people with a surprise. When people come to a support group, they may be hoping, but they're also braced for the worst. Well, here we go. It's going to be another one of those da-da-da talk things. And our job is for people to have a surprise, a sense that, hey, hey, maybe these people might understand, or maybe, may, maybe, I'm not, maybe I'm not alone here. That surprise is something that only happens if we're available to be surprised ourselves. Okay? And that takes being able to shift. All right. So let's talk about tools for helping you to get unstuck in a group situation. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to cultivate what the psychologists now call mindfulness. There are, pe there are a lot of programs that have uh, mindfulness work built into them. Uh, for, for a good example are the intensive outpatient programs that are uh, run by uh, uh, Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. John Kabat-Zinn, I think he was a psychologist who uh, was hired by, I think it was uh, Tufts University Medical Center to do psychological support for people who had cancer-related chronic pain. He couldn't help them. None of the medicines worked. They, a lot of these people were on morphine drips and when they were still dying from pain. And he didn't know what to do. And he, he reached back into his training and decided, okay, I'm going to try to teach these people how to have a different attitude towards pain. And so he started a mindfulness group with these chronic pain patients. And lo and behold, maybe their pain didn't get better, but their pain became more like a piece of them rather than the whole them. And they started smiling, and they started helping each other, and they started even 
helping their doctors. Like, hey doc, don't take it so hard. You know, I'm riding this through and we're okay. People picked it up for work with uh, folks who have borderline personality disorders because their agony was like the agony of somebody who's a cancer patient with chronic pain. People with borderline personality disorders have often been described as people without skin. And a, uh, a psychologist who was cared very deeply about helping these people, many of whom were suicidal, who has le ultimately come public and say that it was because she herself was that way when she was a teenager, uh, uh, Marshall Linehan developed the first uh, use of mindfulness in working with people who have very severe psychological problems. It was called dialectical behavior therapy in the early 90s. And then it just blew from there. And now we have mindfulness stuff that's connected with everything from uh, phobias to addictions and many intensive outpatient programs that are designed to help people who have trouble with stabilizing themselves use mindfulness as a tool. The essence of mindfulness is two simple things. The total awareness of what is going on around us and what is going on inside of us, one. And two, the complete acceptance of everything that's going on around us and inside of us. That means all the thoughts. So mindfulness is not about controlling ourselves. It's about allowing ourselves. These tools can allow us to shift. They can teach us how to let go of our judgments. So one thing that I know is that people who um, are helping other people don't always think about helping themselves. Um, so mindfulness is also good for that. Um, but maybe we can talk about how that's going to um, also show up in your, in your groups. So the first thing that I would like to do, and Ralph mentioned focusing, the first thing that I'd like to do is think about something that's really easy and that we do and that we don't think about, and that's breathing. Okay, so I also know that people get uncomfortable with, oh, you know, I have to pay attention to myself and this is really kooky and, you know, all of the stuff that Ralph was discussing. Um, so try and let that go and just go with it, okay? All right, so I see everyone adjusting. That's good. <laughs> you know, we've all been to the doctor's office, right? So first, imagine yourself, you're in the doctor's office and they've got the stethoscope, right? And they're, they're okay, now take some big, deep breaths. So we're going to do this three times. I want you to think about the deep breath that, would you, that you would do in the doctor's office. Um, and we're going to do that three times, so I'm going to prompt you to do that. But remember where you are. You're in the doctor's office. You're sitting on the table. It's cold. You know, you've got the potentially cold stethoscope coming up to you. And, okay, deep breath for the stethoscope. Go ahead. And remember, you know, you're thinking about, you know, what the doctor is expecting from you and, and what the doctor needs, right? He needs, you know, some chest movement, right? Okay, so we're going to um, focus away from that and think about a different type of breathing, which is breathing using your diaphragm. Okay, so I'm sure we've all heard of, you know, this is the good way to breathe. We're going to breathe through our nose. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to count as well. So we had our big, deep kind of chest breath. And now we're going to focus on, you can put a hand on your abdomen. So think about um, when you breathe in, you're going to breathe in through your nose. Okay. So maybe practice that for a second, just breathing in through your nose. Okay. And you can breathe out through your mouth or you can breathe out through your nose, whatever you're comfortable with. So you're going to think about um, breathing in for three seconds through your nose. And instead of the big chesty breath, right? We're going to think about moving your diaphragm. Okay, so the first breath, just think about moving your, your diaphragm, moving your abdomen. Take one in, and I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. 
Okay, Ralph, I saw your belly move. That's good. <laughs> okay, did anyone else feel their abdomen move? And how different that feels from the big breath in the doctor's office. We all breathe without thinking. Like, it's so simple. We don't think about that. And when I do think about that, I realize how much I can relax myself. And then I think about, man, you know, if I could just tap into this all of the time. You know, we have so many things going on throughout our day, our family, our friends, our work, right? We don't think about that. We're gonna return to the breathing. Okay, so close your eyes, hand on your abdomen again. Okay, so I'm gonna count to three while you're breathing in, and then when you're breathing out, I'm gonna count to three as well. So try and match. Sometimes it's easier for us to breathe longer through the exhale, and that's okay, but at least get three seconds in. So, ready? We're gonna breathe in, I'm gonna count to three, go ahead. One, two, three, and breathe out. One, two, three. And if you can keep going, see how long you can go. <laughs> okay, let's try that one more time. Breathe in. One, two, three. Breathe out. One, two, three. Good. Okay, you can open your eyes. That's a, you know, an example of the practicing of focusing. Um, sh we are shifting our attention there as well because we, we're not thinking about that typically. We're thinking about all of the other expectations and you know things that come up throughout the day. Yeah, and either you as a support group leader or uh, another person that you're, maybe if you're doing something like this in one of your groups, you may find that people are so out of connection with themselves, they can't do it. They, they, they're looking around, they can't, they can't do it. And that's why one addition to the focused attention practice that Heather gave you, which we don't need to go through today, but it's one that I'm sure you'll understand. It's called uh, paradoxical relaxation. And what that is, is that you do the same thing that Heather just said, but instead of relaxing, you start off by tightening that muscle. Tighten it, hold it until you feel the muscle start to tremble a little bit, then relax it. And what that does is that lets people more easily direct their attention to that muscle. See, here's the secret behind all of that. It's not just about relaxation. It's about teaching somebody to aim their mind. We're talking breathing, and we're talking about progressive muscle relaxation, but we're really talking about aiming the thing aiming that mind of yours. And that's the first step of the ability to truly shift. And now what Heather will do is give us an example of letting go. Let's start with keeping our eyes open. Okay, so we're sitting in the room. This is gonna be very easy, so don't worry. Um, we're sitting in this room. What are five things, just think to yourself, that you can see in the room? So you notice them. I'm sure you've all got five by now. Okay. One thing that's interesting to me is that, and, and especially with the people that I work with, this is good for me to tap into just for empathy's sake because I, um, I'm very good at maybe desensitizing things around me. So I might not have noticed that, for instance, this plant is in the back of the room. I think that's the first time I really attended to that plant because I don't, like, my focus is on you guys, right? So it's interesting for me to kind of notice that and think about maybe what some of my clients might be noticing. You know, you're successful at noticing things and you also probably let some of them go on your own anyway because you don't need them, right? So you we're not noticing everything all at once because it's just too much for us to handle, okay? Okay, so close your eyes for this one. Okay, and I want you to think about five things that you can feel. For instance, you might feel your pant leg on your pant that you really haven't been noticing until now. Because we're really great at relaxing and focusing. This is good. Okay, you can open your eyes. 
we work, it, it, we don't even recognize that we're working so hard to tune things out so that we can focus, you know. And I think, again, that's really good for us to remember for the individuals we might be working with. Again, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. You don't have to do it just yet, but we're going to, we're going to imagine ourselves um, in our group space. Okay. So think about what that room looks like. And we're going to go there. Okay, so close your eyes. And, 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 and with every sentence mm -hmm. that Heather gives you, after that sentence about what you're going to notice or what you're going to feel or what you're going to think, just allow that to bubble up as though it were bubbles in ginger ale or just let the thought come and then go. Don't hold on to it. Don't let yourself be locked in. And when you're locked in, let yourself be aware of being locked in. This is an exercise in letting go. Okay. All right. You can close your eyes. Thanks. Okay. So think about your space and imagine that you're arriving early for your next support group meeting. And if these are past years that you had support group meetings, think about that space that you were in then. Okay. Um, you're all alone. You're 15, well, let's say you're 30 minutes early. Okay. No one's coming in yet. Okay. You have plenty of time to relax quietly. Notice five things that you see in that room. Notice your comfort level, and remember to notice it, feel it, acknowledge it, and then let that go. Are you feeling tense? If so, notice it and let it go. Are you feeling confident? You really prepared today. Notice that and let it go. Notice anything getting in the way, in your way today. Thoughts that might come up about family or things you have to do tomorrow, and let that go. Think about how you'll greet your group members. Kind of picture yourself doing that. Notice how you feel as you're doing that, and let that go. Okay, now I want you to think about your role in the group. We're going to talk about this later, but think about your role and the expectations you place on yourself. Notice it and let that go too. Okay, and notice how you're feeling now. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. What kind of feelings do come up for you as you think about being in the group space? So I tried to think of things as bubbles, mm -hmm. and I watched them go to the surface, but then I realized they were balloons with strings, and I'm still attached to them. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to let go of the tough stuff, and then when you said confidence, that's what I strive for. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking about the people that are there, and giving them the attention that they need and deserve, I find myself focusing on why did the other 22 people not come? Mm -hmm. What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. what, where have I let them go? Are they ever going to come back? Have any of the rest of you felt that same, I don't feel like I'm good enough feeling in your own groups? You, is there other like failure feelings that crop up? for a group facilitator. Now remember, if you guys can shift, then you're, you've learned now how to uh, allow the failure feeling to come up. I see more so like of the fear in the parent for even actually getting the diagnosis. And so for me, it's what more could I do, you know, to help assist them 
let, let me see if I got what you're saying, Jamie. It's not so much that you felt like you were, that you were failing, but that this is a really hard struggle, a hard job to get that diagnosis and that you see so many other people going through the same thing that, uh, that that makes you feel even maybe more committed to fighting for them and with them? Yes, yes, yes. And I actually went through a period of time thinking, and this is just like how I feel, how they feel, is somebody might be you know, complaining that their child's not able to speak in full sentences, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, my kid doesn't even say a word. You know, like, how dare you? And it took me a while to get through all that stuff. And, uh, it, you know, and I couldn't be, you know, I couldn't feel bad for them. I'm thinking, you, you're so lucky. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say those things, but this is what's going through my head. It's very human. It, yeah. and, or, or to be the parent sitting there in the room comparing, like, your child and what they just said. And you do a lot of that. Um, you guys have all had this, I assume. I have guilt because my son is high-functioning, and I hear these other parents, and I feel guilty. That's uh -huh. dumb. That's dumb <laughs> because so you that have a lot of... And I realize that down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Being, and then, <laughs> your, your child has to fit in society mm -hmm. a lot more than mine does, and your, your IP is more critical than mine because of, you know, that they can learn. My son couldn't learn, so I had to worry about his behavior. There was issues all which ways. And I know that yeah. now, but that took time. Um, By the way, guys, did you notice, you. did you guys notice about 30 seconds ago how the lift happened? This is a prime example of how a support group operates. You guys were picking up on Jennifer, and then whenever all we did was just tweak that one little bit, what was the most important thing? She narrowed it down, and then all of a sudden, you guys all hooked in to it. That's what we're going to be doing this afternoon. There's a, another story here about whether your personal experiences as a parent or, or a, a loved one of somebody who's special needs, how does that, how does that work into being a, a support group facilitator. So, and I think that this, that there, all these stories may be similar. They're all about, you have a memory and you have a feeling and how do you work that in to being a support group facilitator? Probably it wouldn't necessarily be uh, to uh, um, tell all the other support group leaders, hey, or the other support group members, no, you got to like this. <laughs> uh, it might be for you to be able to be aware that you may feel something very different than they do as they're telling their story. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, maybe the failure feeling is similar in that the feeling isn't a thing. The feeling isn't a reality. The feeling is a feeling, and it doesn't necessarily mean something about what you've done in the past as a group leader or whether you're doing a good job and you got to grade yourself by the number of bodies that walk through the door. You know? So what we're, what we're looking at here is... The shift, the attention shift. So Heather gave us a couple of little experiences of that. And what I tried to do is and think of us as like your support group facilitators mm -hmm. right here. What I tried to do as I was listening to these things, these three stories were riveting. I mean you could I you could hear a pin drop. You know, you're all listening to this. All right. I'm listening to that too, but I'm, I'm at the same time trying to feel what's going on. How's, how's this working here? Does these, do these stories connect? Do your experiences as 
support group facilitators. Do, do you ever notice that they affect your life outside of your role as a support group facilitator? Um, certain level of anxiety of being prepared um, to um, support those families or meet them where they are um, when you yourself maybe struggled through the week and, you know, you're going to go in and we're going to have the, all this information on, you know, getting your kid to take a shower or a bath and your kid's going on day five, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, you know, so the anxiety of being able to support them when maybe um, your week didn't go as swimmingly as you would have liked. You see, guys, if you don't have that ability to shift away from, oh my God, I only have two people here, or I don't, you know, I'm, I'm so tired, or I, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, I, I forgot to unplug the iron or something like that, <laughs> then you're, what you're doing is you're missing those cues. There are those visual cues too. Like you said, people, it's, it's almost, you, and, and, and almost tactile cues, almost the air changes as you're talking about what effect it has on you outside of the uh, actual running of support groups. You talk a lot about the um, feelings that you have. Um, as I watch that, I'm noticing that a, a lot of you, and this is probably because it what makes you good, instinctive, support group facilitators is you're using your eyes a lot that there's a uh, that you guys scan like I'll uh, I'll brush over to here and you're there uh, boom 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 you know it's like you can almost you, you almost feel somebody looking in your direction and you spot that you guys are using your eyes beautifully in here and that's, uh, and you're listening, you're hearing about the anxiety, but at the same time, you're scanning. And that's people who already on some level know how to shift. You can hear it, but you're also here in the room. And that ability to shift back and forth, you model it in your groups, being able to stay alert to everybody, the quiet ones, the noisy ones, everybody.